Hi, this is Craig Hockenberry from the TA Icon Factory, and this is going to be a quick introduction to the API we're using in our Tapestry app. Super excited about this API. It's simple, it's powerful, and it's going to make a lot of cool things possible. I've been using it for about the last half a year and haven't had any problems connecting it to things that I want to and putting them in my prototypes timeline. But we're sure there's going to be cases where there are issues and we expect to deal with them during during a beta test. So one of the reasons we're getting these developer tools out there now is to start identifying some of these issues and pain points. You know, for example, somebody earlier today asked me, can Project Tapestry support matter? And, and I honestly don't know, nor does anybody else at the Icon Factory. Uh, I'm sure that someone out there has specific domain knowledge about the, the APIs there and could implement a, a plugin if it's possible. Um, same is true for a lot of other things. Uh, you know, MISCI is, is a popular federated server, but the documentation is all in Jap Japanese. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I looked at it and was like, oh, I don't know. Um, Lemmy, PixelFed, PeerTube, those are all popular uh, things that, you know, we honestly don't, don't use and don't have a lot of experience with. So. We, I don't think we're going to be able to do everything that everybody wants, but what we can do is provide the tools that help you do what you want, and that in turn will be things that, that other people want. The other reason why I'm doing this demo is to, to show our work and prove that we're, what we're doing here is real. It's like there's no smoke, there's no mirrors. You're going to go be able to reproduce everything that you see in this, in this screencast. So why did we choose JavaScript? Um, if you've made a web page in the last 10 years, chances are pretty good that you know a little bit about JavaScript. There's a huge body of knowledge out there, everything from MDN to Stack Overflow, JS Fiddles, you name it, it's out there. Uh, JavaScript is also a very mature and stable environment. We're not the first ones to use it for scripting uh, outside the context of a browser. Folks at Apple have done an excellent job of making JavaScript core a framework that can be leveraged by any app. For example, the Mail app on, on Mac OS uses it. Uh, it's also a scripting language that shouldn't have any problems with app review. And what we're doing here is no different than what's happened in Safari or Safari extensions. But I think one of the things that's most important for us about JavaScript is that the, it uses a sandbox whose security has been tested and proved over the years, many years, in fact. Uh, it's a pretty solid thing, and security-wise, and that's super important for us building a social timeline because it contains your personal information. Yeah, JavaScript, it was a good choice. First thing we're gonna do is, is download some stuff. I'm on the uh, Project Tapestry GitHub repo here, and there's a thing we call, uh, we're calling Tapestry Loom, which is a developer tool, so I'm going to download that. Um, there's also, in this GitHub repo, there's a bunch of documentation. That sound you hear right now is everybody who's not a developer closing this video because I talk about documentation. <laughs> but it's important, right? So I'm going to talk it through here and uh, tell you what some of the things that, that, that are in here. The API is built upon on top of JavaScript core, which implements ECMA 262. Uh, it present, it, they stay up to up to speed with with changes there. But this is this is probably different than the JavaScript you're using used to using in a browser. Uh, things like support for the document object model, other browser type functions like a fetch API aren't aren't available. I've underlined some links to the functions and objects that are actually available. Turns out there you can do a lot with you know just basically raw JavaScript. So the API consists of a bunch of things. Uh, first, what we're going to talk about are variables. Um, these are the settings that are exposed in the Tapestry app. Uh, there, there'll be UI to set these these variables. Um, they're under the user's control. Uh, the script has access to these variables. They're read-only access. Uh, the example here is. Uh, if we're building a Mastodon plugin, you know, we could use Mastodon as a social as a plugin or as a placeholder in the text field. The label for the field would be instance. Um, 
there would be some type checking to make sure that it's a valid URL and the variable uh, name would be called site. So the user would be able to specify, you know, mastodon.social, mastodon.art, hackyderm.io, whatever. The variable that can then be used in your in your in a script by just referencing it as a you normally would in JavaScript just by name. Um, in this case, we're using the site name to build a URL that we can use for, for sending a request. The prototype's timeline consists of only three objects. Um, there's a post object, which actually is the content that you see. There is a creator object, which is the entity that created that post. And there are attachments, which are things like media, images, GIFs, whatever. The plugins are responsible for creating these objects. And for example, a post has a creator, a post can have multiple attachments. The plugin is responsible for establishing those relationships and returning them back to the app. Another thing is actions. Okay, the, these are things that the Tapestry app will call within your plugin. Probably the most used one is this load function where we go and you know, if somebody hits the you know, refresh button in the app, we're going to call your load function to pull in new content from whatever endpoints you have uh, set up. Identify is another one that gets used uh, frequently, and that's something that, uh, you know, Tapestry app will need to differentiate between different instances of the plugin. For example, you could have more than one multiple more than one Mastodon account. So you can have more than one uh, identity for those different instances of the plugin. You know, Chalk and Berry, maybe one account. Icon Factor, maybe another. Um, same is true with, with uh, blogs, right? RSS feeds. They're all using the same XML plugin, XML feed plugin but they will have different names, you know, Daring Fireball, Kotki.org, whatever. So that's actions. Uh, the other thing is functions. Okay, these are JavaScript functions that we've implemented inside of the Tapestry app. These are things that your plugin will need from us. For example, sending a request. Again, ECMAScript doesn't have any fetch API, so we are the ones that are going to be doing the fetch on your behalf. This send request is very similar to the fetch API. If you've used it before, you know, give it a URL, it returns your promise. When the request is done, promise fires, you get the results, you do whatever you want with them. One thing that's different than, than what you may be used to is that the, we're going to be doing a lot of things for you when we send that request. An example is uh, adding OAuth or JWT authentication that's needed. For example, if you're talking to a Mastodon endpoint, we're going to manage the user's credentials, their their access tokens. Um, you, as a plugin developer, will never see that information. That's for security purposes. It also makes it a lot easier for you, right? You don't have to worry about endpoints at that point. Another important function is the uh, XML parse function. We built this because we needed a way to convert an, an XML feed into uh, something that we could process with, with JavaScript. So basically it takes a, a, the text from uh, the XML and creates a, a JSON object graph from that. Last thing that's in the documentation of the configuration. And these are the files that provide metadata and JavaScript code to the Tapestry app. Uh, plugin config says, you know, like whether you're using OAuth or not. The UI config, which we saw earlier, lets you specify variables uh, that are needed by your plugin. And then there's the plugin.js file, which is actually the app or the, the plugins code. So let's look at some of the things we can do with this API and 
In order to do that, we're going to poke around in the plugins folder at GitHub. I've got a copy of it right here. So let's start this guided tour. Uh, we downloaded the app previously. We can launch it. First time launch. And there's nothing there. Just as an aside here, um, this Mac OS app is actually written in Swift UI. Um, our initial focus is obviously on iOS, but this Mac app is using all the same framework functions that, that the iOS app is using. So pretty good way to for us to make sure that we're doing things in a cross-platform way that, that keeps everything aligned. So there's not much to look at here, but we can open the plugins folder. This folder is important because this is where you're going to be able to create your own plugins. You're going to be able to do your own work here. But for right now, what we're going to do is we're just going to copy the plugins over from uh, the, the GitHub repo into the plugins folder here. Okay, they don't show up immediately. We're going to have to quit the Tapestry app and relaunch it. Now we see we got the blog feed, blue sky, and all the different things. Cool. First thing we're going to start off is with is probably the plugin I'm most proud of. Uh, as a Californian, earthquakes are important to me. But more importantly, this plugin took less than an hour for me to make. Okay, and that's less than, it's really less than an hour from the time I went to the page at the USGS to the time that. You know, it showed up in the timeline on the the prototype app. It really is easy to to build these things. I make the window a little bit bigger here, so we got a little bit more room to look at stuff. So let's tap the load button and see what happens. That just called the load function in our JavaScript plugin. That load function. Build a bunch of post objects, for, uh, JavaScript objects, and return them to the app. So we can see there's been a bunch of earthquakes, and there's one bunch in Hawaii right now. So we uh, we can look at what each post contains. Each post has a date. That's important because that lets us sort things chronologically. Every post has a URI. That's a way of guaranteeing uniqueness. In fact, we know it's unique because it has a unique identifier at the end of this URL. Uh, there aren't any attachments. The creator is the USGS uh, earthquake site. Um, we gave it the name Latest Earthquakes from USGS, and it has an avatar. So we can open that up and see that's the avatar that we're going to see in the timeline. Uh, and there's also the, the content here at the bottom. That's the actual content that was returned as HTML to Tapestry. In fact, we created a link in that, and we can tap on that and see, yep, that looks like Hawaii. Which part of Hawaii? That's the big island. Cool. We know where that earthquake happened. So you're going to see, you're going to have a plug in here, right? Now let's actually do something with, those plugins. You don't want to modify them. So let's open that up in BB Edit. Go over to the earthquake here. And there's our plugins code. That that really is all of all of this happened in 42 lines of code. Not a lot of comments, but still <laughs> pretty good. Um, so let's say we want to make a change here. Oops. We come over here. Act. We're going to make a change that only chalk could love. We're going to add some stuff to the content. So let's try that out. Now, since we've changed the source code file, we're going to have to reload the plugin. That reinitializes the JavaScript context, reloads the scripts, resets the variables, everything. Just kind of start from scratch again. So we reload that plugin. Um, now we're going to say load and uh, Fox code as a bug. Imagine that. So we're at the point now where we need a debugger. 
Luckily, Safari has a really excellent excellent wand, and Tapestry Loom can use it. So we come over here to, to Safari, and you're going to need the developer menu enabled. And when you say automatically show the web inspector for JS contacts and automatically pause when connecting to the JS contacts. But what happens now when we reload the plugin? Hey, there is a some JavaScript. And we can see, up, oh, yep, it's got the new thing that we added there. Let's set a breakpoint um, and see what happens when we do the load. Now you notice that it's 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 got a beach ball here on the, back on the app. And that's because the the app pauses while the inspector is initialized, and you have to actually continue the script execution in order for the app to come back to life. So we do that. We're back in the loom. Now we hit the load button, and we can hit our breakpoint. So we step over that content. What's the content look like? That looks good. Okay, let's step over again. <laughs> that's obviously the thing that's causing the problem. So it, let's look at the error. It's a type error attempted to assign to read-only property. Ah, uh, shock! Forgot that this was a const. Let's fix that then. Not the first time we fixed this bug for him. He makes a lot of bugs. So we can close that window now. We're Gonna reload the plugin. So come back over here to Tapestry Loom, reload the plugin. We're back. We can see we got the fix there. Let's start it up and see what happens. So we do our load now. Hit the breakpoint. Content looks the same. We're gonna add our little bit at the end there of it. Okay, and we're gonna create a post from that. Cool. Now we're going to hit the breakpoint again because there's more than one thing in that collection. So I'm just going to disable that and say let her, let her rip. So now we go back and look at the content and hey, 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 guess what? We got chocolates here on every single one of our things coming back from the plugin. Cool. The other thing that's really useful for uh, the, in the web inspector is actually to get an idea of what you're getting back from the endpoint. Um, this is one of the things that helped me do the uh, the plugin in, in less than an hour. Because, you know, look at here, we, we just parse the JSON or the text as a JSON object. And so we can come over here and say, JSON objects, what do we got there? Well, it's a feature collection with a bunch of features. So let's JSON object dot features. Let's look at the first one. Yep, that looks like it's a pretty interesting thing. It's got some obviously some lat long coordinates the point in the on the Earth's surface. Got some details. That are look like some sort of a feed. I don't, I don't know. Ah, but the title is the thing that we're probably going to want to put out there because it's got the magnitude, the the where it happened, um, and it's got a unique uh, identifier here in the URL. So that's really helpful information. Um, can also be useful for experimenting with the types of content you want to produce. So we continue here to the next breakpoint and we built the content, but let's say, well, we're thinking about something else. So let's look at some different kind of content. We can just pop that, you know, override the content that we did there, continue. And we should see hack the planet appear in our content now as the first item. And yep, there it is. Pretty cool. We pretty pretty much. I've showed you how the uh, the the debugger works. We're not gonna. We're gonna. I'm gonna disable that again now because we're not gonna be making any more bugs. <laughs>
There we go. Easy. So let's look at the uh, the other plugin that, that's a little bit more complicated. There's our friend plugin.js. Um, you know, we went from 42 lines of code to what, 140. So it's a little bit longer, but it's still very manageable amount of code. It's also got a more interesting configuration now because it's got OAuth configurations. Um, there's that site variable, which, you know, contains the URL. One thing that's interesting about that OAuth configuration is that it's the same one used in microblog and Tumblr both. They both use OAuth and the same code and tapestry is used to, to get the access tokens uh, for the API. Um, again, the plugin doesn't have to know anything about all of that. So again, super easy. Um, it's got a load function just like the earthquake ones. The earthquake ones does, but in this time, in this case, we're actually sending two requests. The first is for the home timeline. Um, we get a bunch of requests or results there. Again, it's JSON. Parse those out, pop them in, or send them back to the uh, Tapestry app with the process results. Then we send another request for the uh, mentions. Again, process those and send them back to the app with process results. Likely that that's going to be a configuration option. You know, some people are going to want to see mentions, some people won't. But you know, the point of the prototype was to prove that that everything worked. This is also a case where we're going to use the identify function. So Tapestry will call this function when it needs to know, you know, who it's for. And the way we do that is we call the endpoint to verify the credentials, get back a JSON object, and return the username. So let's see what happens when we try to use this plugin. Go over to Mastodon. First thing I need to do is set some variables. I need to tell it where my Mastodon instance is. So no, it's HTTPS colon slash mastodon dot social. Authorize that. Now this is something that's being handled by the app itself, including the two-factor authentication code. And you see that it took a pause there for a second and then it came back and it called that identify with the identify function with the, the new OAuth. Um, access token and figure out that I'm talking very cool. So I can save that now. And now when I load, there are all the things that are coming off of Mastodon. Everything that's happened recently for me. So that is a developer tool, Tapestry Loom, that should be enough for you to at least get started playing with it. Um, Another thing I wanted to show you here is how this looks in an actual app. So I've got screen recording going on on my phone here. Come back, there we go. Launch the app. There's nothing there. And sort of like Loom, right? We're to, you know, obviously we're gonna have a better startup experience than this, but you know, you go over to settings, you can add a source. Let's do that earthquake one. No variables here, so I could just save it. Go back to the timeline, and there are all my earthquakes. A lot of earthquakes. If I tap on one, it shows me the earthquake. If I tap on the avatar, it tells me, you know, a little bit about the program that keeps track of those. It's pretty simple. Those basically are the URIs. Uh, let's add another source. Uh, I'm a big fan of comics. So I've got some presets here. I'm going to say I want to see Nancy. Goes off and it verifies that the comic is, is valid and gets its name. It's Nancy. Go back. There's today's Nancy comic. 
And the interesting thing here is that we're getting the information not from an API of source, but we're getting it from the open graph tags out of the HTML. Who says you can't parse HTML with one regex? Let's also look at some, some feeds here. Okay, let's, I've got another preset for uh, Jason Kotke's website. I hit verify. Again, it goes off. Query is the, the URL that I've set there. Figures out that it's kotke.org and I can save it. Now, somewhere in here, yep, there's a Kotke post. Yes, yep, there's another one. So those are all coming and you can see down here, I will select it. Uh, you see it says JSON feed at the bottom there. Now uh, that one's USGS earthquakes. You know, one up here says go comics. So those are different sources. Let me go add another source. Oh, let's do a blog feed. Mary Sue is good because it's got a lot of images. I'm going to verify that. Again, goes off, doesn't identify. We're good. Save it. Come over here to the timeline. And now we've got Mary Sue as a source. It's, it's a blog feed that has all of the uh, all of their posts from their XML feed. And in this case, we can look at the images. Pretty cool. Now, some things to note here. There's some things to note here. This app is really ugly, <laughs> both from a uh, visual point of view and the uh, coding too, right? There's no data persistence. It, it, we were out to prove that uh, that this stuff worked. Um, and it did, it proved that this concept is solid. Uh, some things that we wanted to make sure worked okay was uh, all of these, uh, endpoints return data as HTML, and anybody who's ever tried to display HTML in a scrolling table view on iOS knows that that's just not a good idea. So what we're doing is we're actually converting all of the HTML to attributed strings on the fly, uh, adding um, you know paragraph attributes and things like that for block quotes. The technique that'll allow us at, at some point in the future to support markdown as a content format, not to say HTML. Um, also, we're using UIKit for the main timeline, right? This is all UIKit. The stuff over here is all Swift UI. The reason we used uh, UIKit there is purely performance. I mean, Swift UI scrolling has gotten better recently, but Still can't beat manually recycling uh, view cells. There are also some issues with Swift UI and attributed strings. Um, can't do things like paragraph styles uh, for an invitation. Whereas UIKit and AppKit can both do those without any problem. Again, since there's no persistence, we're loading all the images on the fly. There's nothing in the images cast to disk. And that's important because we wanted to make sure that, you know, loading images, loading stuff from a plugin and converting HTML to, to attributed strings. Those are all fairly resource uh, intensive operations. Um, <clears throat> for example, getting Java, a JavaScript promise into async await was quite a challenge, but it was essential. And, and we were able to, to get all of that work off of the main thread. And the result is that things are really buttery smooth. It's, it's worked out a lot better than than we had initially hoped. So there you have it. Um, the Tapestry API, how we're using it. Um, the possibilities for this app and the API are super exciting. Um, we hope after seeing this that you share some of that excitement. And if you do, please back that Kickstarter. We really want to build this thing. Um, but honestly, you know, we can't without the help of the community. We're not going to take venture capital to make it happen because that's just going to, that destroys every social product that, that it's ever taken venture capital. I'm uh, Chalk and Barry on Mastodon.social. So if you have any questions, please.
don't hesitate to ask. And thank you for watching. Bye.